اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على انبياء اجمعين والمسيح والمحفي والمجدد لنا من مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing will exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no part. And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles. And on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the God. And on the Mujahidah, the Mephon, which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, The True Light, featuring Al-Sayyid, Al-Imam Isa, Al-Hadi, Al-Mahdi. Yeah, we'd like to know, um, how did the Quran come about? The first thing is that, if you turn to your book of Revelations, chapter 10, in the books of Revelations, chapter 10, John, who's receiving this revelations from the angel Michael, for the Messiah, Jesus, is going to tell you about the scripture. All right, now we get a prediction way back in the books of Deuteronomy 18, chapter 15. And in this prediction coming to Moses about the children of Israel and the brethren of Israel who are Ishmael, they speak about another prophet coming who the children of Israel should learn to obey after Moses. When John was asked, Is he that prophet? He said, no. When they asked him, is he the Messiah? He said, no. no. They asked him, was he Elijah? He also said, no, because later Jesus told him he was. Then he found that he was. But he was definitely not the Messiah who was Jesus, and he was not that prophet. So even up until Jesus' time, we were still expecting a prophet. And there were certain attributes about that prophet. If you go to Isaiah 29, 12, it's going to give you one of the attributes of that prophet. And that was that this prophet, was, if someone goes they can find it, that this prophet was not educated. He was not a reading person. He was not learnt. To be unlearnt or a non-reader in Hebrew is goy. Goy means, when translated by you, Gentiles. Gentiles were people who were, according to the Jew, not under the laws of Abraham and Moses, who were not followed, or in Arabic we say Ummiyin, or Ummi, which means one who is illiterate, or one who did not read the scriptures, Torah, Zabur, Injil. All right? So now, when you go to Isaiah 29, 12, someone read it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. Well, now stop. A book is being given to some man who is not learned. Moses, as we know, was well learned because he was educated in the courts of where? Well, Egypt, correct? No. Jesus, we know, was well learned because Jesus was dictating to the elders at the age of 13 in the temple and reading from the Torah while in Nazareth in a synagogue. So Jesus was able to read. So now when we get to Jesus, down to Moses, what other prophet came after Moses in the house of Israel. None. So now what other man came who claimed to be a prophet from the house of Ishmael who are the brothers of Israel? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prophet Muhammad called Ahmed or the comforter by Jesus in his scripture. And now this is pointed out in the Holy Quran in the 97th chapter called Laylatul Qadri the night in which this incident could happen, which was the incident of revealing the Holy Quran, which was in the year 610, in the ninth month, on the 19th night, which is the month of Ramadan, while Muhammad 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave victory to Allah and the angel Gabriel came down to him in a big beaming shining light like the sun they say and he called out to Muhammad and said to Muhammad Muhammad Ikra read not recite or proclaim like most orthodox Muslims that poison people he said Ikra to read something and now this brother reads again Isaiah 29 12 you get what and the book is delivered to him that is not learned saying read this exactly we get exactly here in Isaiah the statement reads the same thing that the whole Muslim world and the so-called Jews acknowledged was a statement said to Muhammad this was not said to Jesus it was not said in John in John they didn't tell John to read this book they told John to write this book they said write what you see here okay so now we come up with the reality that this prophet that Moses spoke about and that they asked Jesus and John about hadn't come even up to Jesus' time. A prophet who was uneducated or a Gentile, a Omiya, or a Goy. And that this prophet would be given a scripture as a sign because Israel transgressed and a new covenant was made through the house of Ishmael because in the scripture the Almighty said that Allah will hear. That's why his name is Ishmael from Semaah to hear. Okay? So now when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to come up with the mentioning of the Holy Quran. Here it says in Revelation chapter 10 verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel. This is not just a regular malaik. This angel is Shadid, a He's a strong angel. Come down. In the Holy Quran, Allah says in the 97th chapter, he sent down his angels in that night. Malaikati. And and with them was Aruh. Alright? Aruh is Mikael or Melchizedek. All of the angels which are inclusive of Gabriel. That's the same statement in the Quran in the 97th chapter. It's right here in Revelation chapter 10. And I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven. He was wrapped in the clouds. And a rainbow was upon his head. The rainbow is always symbolized as an aura of light in the scriptures. Always. Especially through the books of Revelation. And a rainbow was upon his head. The rainbow is a symbol way back in Genesis when Noah, the prophet of the flood, saw the rainbow as a sign of the time for the coming of the end of the world, he told him. That, that rainbow was a symbol that the world was getting ready to be destroyed. Now this is the last revelation, the last scripture to the last prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this rainbow that Jibril had around him in the form of an aura was a sign. And the rainbow is composed of the seven colors. And the seven colors are symbolic of the seven stones. And the seven stones are symbolic of the seven angels who bring forth the seven forceful plagues to plague the world at the end of it in Revelation 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. That's what that rainbow symbolizes. The light from the stones, from the apron of the Kohen, which is from the ancient Israelite temple of the order of Aaron. Okay. He says, And his face was as it were the sun. That means he had a bright aura. And his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book. A little book. Now, remember, this is the book of Revelation, okay? This book was revealed in the year 96. This is way after all the events of Christianity had taken place. This book was being revealed to a man named Johanna John while in prison on an island called Patmos in Rome. This is when he received this. So this is way after all the events of Christianity, way after the book of Moses, way after the book of all the rest of these things, okay? This is 96. This is even after Matthew, Mark, and Luke and all the Corinthians books. This is after, the only one after this one here is his book, John, because the angel tells him in the book of Revelation to go out and prophesy. So he goes out and receives another book, the book of John. But all the other books, the historians and Christianity will look at the dates, will find these books had already come, already been revealed. All right, so it says, and this angel had in his hand a little book, 140 
13 chapters, a small book compared to the size of what they call the Old and the New Testament. You follow? The Quran was considered a small message, the message given to that prophet who could not read. All right. And the book was open. Why did they say it was open? Because when Malika, Jibrail, when he came, Zahar ila Rasulullah, when he came to the Prophet Muhammad, he had the book in his hand and told Muhammad to do what? Ikra. To read. So the book had to have been open to a certain point, you see. And he gave him one of the verses of the Quran. Ikra. Bismi Rabbik aladhi khalaq. Khalaq al insana min alaq. He told him. All right, so the book was open for Muhammad. And he sat his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. This is speaking about his personification. They say he got his feet on the water and the earth. This means he came down in the form of a human being. He was a part of gravity. He was a part of the natural elements. All right? Go ahead. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. That's the seven plagues that we're talking about. And uh, Revelation 8, 5 will speak about those seven spirits. Go ahead. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me. Now John wanted to write this information that he read in this book that he saw in this angel Gabriel's hand who was being passed to Muhammad. But the voices from heaven told him, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. That's the exact same thing that Daniel was told in Daniel's 8, 26, as well as in Daniel's 12, 4, and 9. Daniel himself had the angel come to him and he wanted to reveal what he had saw in the vision which was the Quran and the angel told him seal it up until the end of the world. It's not time for the revelation of the Quran to be revealed to the world. Go ahead. And write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his head to heaven, his hand to heaven. That's right. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that there are therein are. He did not, as John was accustomed to doing, pledge loyalty at this time to Jesus the Messiah. He didn't do that. Or to he who was sitting on the throne the Ancient of Days. He didn't do that. At this point, because he was talking about a revelation outside of their teachings, he pledged all his loyalty to the Heavenly Father. He went above Jesus at this point. Like the Christians say, you can't get to the Father but by me. They say Jesus made that statement. The only way to get to heaven is you got to use him. Well, John right here did not use Jesus. He went straight directly to the Heavenly Father in his prayer. Repeat that again. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. He said, pray to the Heavenly Father, because when you see this book come to earth, the end is near. In the Masrullahi Qariban. Surely the help from Allah is near. That's what he was telling him. Go ahead. But in the days of the voice of the seventh, seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Allah shall be finished, as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. And if you read in the Revelations 21 and 22, you see when that seventh angel releases his last vow or bowl of plagues upon the earth, that's the end. Go ahead. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Told John, go get that book. Go get that Quran. Take it. And I went. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. He said, Take it, digest it, eat it up. Which is also used when a student learns. He says, Eat it up. Consume this information, this book. All of it. And it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. The truth of it, of this Quran, is going to be very sweet to taste when you first come in contact with Al-Islam. You like the doctrine, you like how you sound, you now have answers. But then when the Lord come in and say, you got to stop doing this and stop doing that, it transforms like milk 
from a sweet taste to something sour in your stomach. The responsibilities of don't marry a white man, don't do this, don't work with the devil, don't do anything. You start saying, I like the doctor, I like knowing who I am, I'm a newbie, I'm glad I found my language, but I don't want to move in any community and live under any laws. This is what he told him. The Quran is going to have that effect on one hour with me. Same thing. We do not want to be together. We do not want to, as Jesus called it, bear the cross. We don't want to suffer. We want to get into heaven. We want to get all the easy things. Holy Quran chapter 2, 2, 14 tells you you're not going to get into heaven without going to tribulation. The same tribulation that Ben Israel went to. And I took the little and book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. The truth was sweet. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly became bitter. As soon as he saw what it was talking about, the judgment of the world, Zilzal, the earthquake that Revelation speaks about, Faria, Faria, the morning star, when he saw the Aria, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, when he saw that all of the revelations that he was receiving in the book of Revelations about the four horsemen, the morning star, the plagues and the vows and the sea of blood was all chapters in this holy Quran. When John saw that, he became sick for the reality of it. And then what they say, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples. Now go out and write another book, John. Prophesied again before many people. And peoples and, and nations tongues. and tongues and kings. And John went out and two years after this book of Revelation, he wrote the book of St. John, which was revealed to him in 98. And talked about the coming in that book of St. John. What did he speak about? He spoke about the coming of the Comforter. The Comforter being Muhammad, the Ahmed. This is what he was told to do in Revelation chapter 10, to tell them about the Comforter. Go out and prophesy to all people, John. So John did what he was commanded to do, and when he finished his whole explanation for St. John chapter 1, doesn't sound like Christianity at all. St. John chapter 1 eliminates all pluralization of deities He's not addressing God and the Trinity at all. He addresses them in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Allah, and the Word was Allah. He still put Allah, or as they say, God, in the singular. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, singular. And without Him, singular, there was not anything made that was made. In Him, singular, was the life. And the life was the light of men, plural. You see that? He was in that Elohim, Adonai Elohim, Ahad principle or la ilaha illallah as we say in Arabic principle wahtahu la sharika lahu he was not into saying father son and holy ghost because he just saw the Quran and the Quran just told him to worship the heavenly father not to worship Jesus and it was bitter and so therefore he had to go out and the last book the very last book of the New Testament to be revealed was this book the book of John and he didn't do this book while in the Isles of Patmos, he went to the Euphrates to do this book because in the book of Revelations near the end, the last plague would take place in Armageddon or Armageddon in Palestine and then a multitude of armies would ride across from the Euphrates. So he went right to the spot that he was taught that that master army with so many soldiers that no man could count it would come from Euphrates. And there John received this last book, the book of St. John. So the Holy Quran, the Muslims hold in their hand, has been predicted through the Torah and all the way down to the Zabur. Torah meaning the Old Testament, which is the five books of Moses, of course, and then the books of their prophets, all the way down to the Zabur, which is the Psalms of David, and then all the way up into the books of Jesus in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, that this little book would come. And then when it came, what did they do? Did they accept it? Or did they reject it? Rejected. Now, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Lord that Creator will raise up unto thee a prophet from among the midst of thee, of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. He is being told that when the Lord, the Adonai Elohim, the Lord thy God, Adonai Elohim, when he raises up this Nebi, this prophet, a Nebi is a person who's going to bring you a book. Nebi means to bring news, Nebi. He's going to bring from amongst thee of thy brethren. 
she's going to be from amongst you, she's going to be living in the same area. This is where Ishmael went, or Ismail went. He would be from your brothers, because who's he talking to? He's talking to the prophet Musa, or Moshe, Moses. And he's talking to him about some other prophet coming out of their brothers. And that prophet says, According to all that thou desirest of the Lord that created in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my creator, neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. This is the people when they were in the times of Exodus 2019, and in Deuteronomy 9 and 10, when he spoke about the children of Israel in the hours when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, brought down the commandments of the laws and found them living in whoredom like an evil and adulterous nation would, and cast it down and fire came up. They were saying, this man is coming next according to all that thou desires of the Lord, thy creator, or Adonai Elohim, in Herod, in the days of the assembly when they all gathered, saying, let me not hear again the voice of my Creator. Elohim, Adonai, neither, neither let, let me see a great fire. That's right. Then what does it say? And the Lord said, Adonai said, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. We will never, they said, go back and worship a golden calf again. You will not have to take this new revelation that's going to come down from heaven with this prophet Muhammad and cast it aside like you had to do when Moses came down and found us worshiping a golden calf. We will obey this prophet when he comes, Lord. This is what the children of Israel under Musa is telling the Heavenly Father about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when he comes, they would be willing to obey him and they would not find them doing the same things that they were doing in Moses' time. Go ahead. Okay, we're in the 18th verse of Deuteronomy 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. Like you, Moses. This prophet Muhammad is going to be like you, Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth. And Muhammad said, when he said to Muhammad, Ikra, he said, Ya Jibrael, ma'ana in. I cannot read. The Lord could not use him to speak. Through the Spirit, he had to place his words inside of Muhammad. And say, Muhammad recited the exact same way I give it to you. That's how I want it written down, this Quran. I don't want men playing with it the way they played with Deuteronomy, the way they played with the different books. The way I give it to you, that's how I want you to say it exactly. Go ahead. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. The only thing Muhammad says is what was given to him in the Quran. That's all. He has no authority on his own. Go ahead. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken to my words which he shall speak in my name. Now he's telling Ben Israel that any of them who do not become followers of Muhammad and be obedient to this Quran which he's going to send to the brothers of Israel, which is Ishmael, what? I will require it of him. That's right, he's going to be judged. Go ahead. But the prophet which shall presume to speak your word in my name. And as for any prophet who comes and speaks in my name, he says, which I have not commanded him to speak. And I didn't command him to speak these words, what will I do? Or that shall speak in the name of other deities, even that prophet shall die. So now, if this is a covenant of the Heavenly Father with ben Israel, what they call their chosen, and the things they prayed for came true, that water parted for them, manna came out of the heavens for them, a black cloud protected them. Everything they asked for in the name of the Heavenly Father, they received under Moshe or Musa, alayhi salam. All right? Here he said that if any prophet prophesied in his name that he did not authorize, what will he do to him? A prophet should die. Why then didn't Rasulullah Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, die when he made the first proclamation in the year 610 that the angel Gabriel had come to him and brought him a revelation and that he was the last and the seal of all the prophets and that Israel and Ismail and Midian should come and bow and obey him. Why then didn't Muhammad die? Well the reason why in history that you don't find any more prophets coming is because all of this, if this is the word of the Heavenly Father, which shouldn't be shaken, any prophet who came and proclaimed himself a prophet, what happened to him? He would die. If Therefore, we wouldn't hear about him anyway. So the only prophet that we did hear about was whom? A man born in the year 570 
in Arabia with our lad who was a direct descendant from Nabi Ibrahim to his son Ismail and Khidar and that was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who received that Quran which is that little book and that all the people of the world, all the tribes of the world, every tongue and every language should gather around. And if you go to Mecca, the holy city, you'll see the revelation, all the tribes of the world, people of all tongues and all languages and all nationalities and everything are gathering at one point in the world. This is what's mentioned in the book of Revelation. This doesn't happen in Christianity. This doesn't happen in modern day Judaism or Jewishism. It only happens in Islam, the Deen Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would like to know, can there be a dialogue between Christians and Jews and Muslims? Can there be well, a the difference is, when you read your Bible, when you understand the scriptures, you'll find out that it's not us that's running from the dialogue. It's them that's running from the dialogue. It's not us, not the Muslim. The Muslim will sit down and talk to anybody about Deen. I'll give you a perfect example. Some of the people in that room are Christians, correct? Or were Christians. We assume between the both of us that some of us in this room are or were Christians. They came to this hall and they were allowed, like yourself, to ask any question they want, correct? As a Muslim, we put ourselves in a position to be questioned. Christians won't do that. If they do, they say, write it down on a piece of paper, submit it to the reverend, and he'll address the question later. They won't allow themselves to be put in an open forum like this, where they can be questioned unless... It's not us that is shying away from that, because we have al-haq. We have the facts beyond any doubt from Allah. They're the ones who shy because they can't answer questions. And I'll give you a perfect example. If you go to something like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a very common point. Have it. Read it and see what happens. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. This is Paul talking now about his gospel that he preaches unto you. Which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. Now he says that everybody is saved from the doctrine he preached. Here's the thing about that. That's the book of Corinthians 1, right? Right. It was revealed in the year 55 A.D. You understand that? 55 A.D. Now watch what he says. Go ahead. By which you also saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, Paul says that he's preaching to you what he received, correct? Right. How Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. I ask you, what scripture is he talking about? You tell me, because he can't be talking about any of the books of the New Testament because none of them were revealed yet. What scriptures he's talking about? He's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, because like I just told you, John was revealed in 98. That was way after him. He can't be talking about Revelations, because Revelations was revealed in when? In 96. Right? What is he talking about? Mark? Mark is revealed in 65. Luke was revealed in 58. Now, here he got a book. He's standing there in the year 55, and he's telling you that he got his doctrine from a scripture, right? right? But all the scriptures that talk about the death and resurrection of Christ have not even been revealed yet. So what scripture is he talking about? He has to be talking about the scriptures of old. He had to be talking about the Psalms. He had to be talking about Genesis and those books. He was not even referring to Christianity. So the Christians don't want a dialogue because they don't want intellectual involvement. They want radical debates by uninformed Muslims because 90% of the Muslim world is very uninformed about the scriptures. They don't know the first thing about the Bible. So therefore a Christian preacher can take the average Muslim apart. 
But now when someone is a scholar of the scriptures and the languages of the scriptures, then it becomes more difficult. So they don't want dialogues like that. So what they do is they go to places like al Azhar in Egypt and they get some guy who's only learned in Islamic things, like the Quran and the Hadith, that's all he knows, and they get him, and then they get some shrewd Christian preacher who's very learned in all the scriptures. This Egyptian comes out to represent all Islam, all of us now, don't know the first thing about the Bible, never studied the Torah, because he keeps saying the Torah is tampered with, so he never bothered to read the thing. And the Christians come up and take him apart and make us all look like we don't know anything. But me, they'll never let me come out to speak because why? First of all, I'm too dark. I don't have the look they want. Well, see, they want some white man with no beard, a shirt, and a cable toe, which you call a tie on his neck. And he has to come out and say, well, according to the Sunnah, we don't have to wear beards. And according to the Sunnah, we don't have to wear jalabiya. We don't have to wear Islamic clothes. We don't have to do this. And he lays aside the laws of Allah and picks up the commandments of men, the practices and traditions of men. And that gives the devil an upper hand. Because when the Christian is debating with you, he is using all of Paul's books. You follow that? But when you start debating with Muslims, he starts using hadith. He can't use the Qur'an to debate Christianity because there's not enough about it in the Qur'an. And he was not intelligent enough to go back and study the Torah. And I've seen many debates by Ahmed Dida and all these new debaters. And they got one guy who's good, and that's Ahmed Dida. But the average Arab doesn't know the first thing about the Bible. These are the people you put your trust in. Al Islam comes to you, and your parents say, those Muslims are crazy. They kill people. They're heathens. They don't believe in Christ. They're going to hell. Blah, blah, blah. Who's going to hell? You pray five times a day. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't use drugs. You don't fornicate. We acknowledge everybody who's obedient to Allah as our brothers and sisters in the world. And we're the heathens. What Muslims you hear about going around publicly with prostitutes? What Muslim ministers? I'm not talking about American ministers or any. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to reprove the world of sin also. Jesus said that he sent another comforter because what he came to do they didn't accept. So he has to send another one and that one was Ahmed, Muhammad who came and he removed it. Because Muhammad came with strict laws and Ben Israel had. Israel prays three times a day. Rasulullah Muhammad said, y'all need more than three, y'all need two more. Make it five. Correct? No. We wore veils back in Abraham's time. The woman, he took them off. And Rasulullah Muhammad came with the Quran and said, put them back on. Put the men back in their robes. Gather in the masjid. Live in communities. Get back to one language. Get back to the language of the scripture. Make your children memorize the scriptures. Go back to the way of the old time religion. The religion of Abraham. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Fil Quran al Kareem, we call it Mila Ibrahim. And anybody who forsakes it, the Holy Quran says in the second chapter, the 130th verse, anyone who rejects it or turns away from it, it's only a fool. And I say that to the whole Muslim world. They're fools. And I tell you this. What's going on in Iran? What's going on in Iraq and Syria and Egypt and in my country, Sudan? And what's going on in Libya and what's going on amongst Muslims all over the world is never going to be solved until they turn back to Sabir Allah. It will not be solved because some angry Imam wants to. It will not be solved because they're fighting for territory. It will not be solved because they're fighting for wealth. It won't be solved in this world until they turn back to the worship of the Heavenly Father and put their trust in His hands. Then the war of the world will stop. Otherwise, I'm here to tell you people on earth that y'all are on a path of your total destruction. You are now in the era of the Aquarian age, you've passed out of the Pisces age, you've entered into the Aquarian age in the 60s, and in the Aquarian age there's supposed to be reformation, and you people are not reforming. Jesus was the master of the Piscean age. It went out, and now we're in the Aquarian age, the heir of Michael, who will arrange the coming of the return of the Messiah for you. It's like a booking. The universe is 
millions and millions of years old. And there's masters. You have 12 of them on earth right now. And they're gathering the people from different points of the world to prepare them for the return of the Messiah. See, a lot of Muslims never bothered to ask us why we're telling them how much we disagree with that and disagree with this. They never really asked us what do we think of Jesus, the Messiah. See, they always ask us, was he crucified? Did he die on a cross? Was he black? And they say, what do y'all believe pertaining to him? And I'll tell you that Jesus got a double portion insofar as he used the word resurrection. The word resurrection means to raise from the dead, to resurge, to come back again. Now the Christians unfortunately have mistaken resurrection with revival. When Jesus went to Lazarus, he did not resurrect Lazarus. What he did was he revived Lazarus. There's a big difference. Or every person that dies in the hospitals in America and then they bring them back, did that person resurrect? There's been cases of people being dead for two and three days in America and then they got their pulse running again and put them on a machine. Every one of those people did not resurrect. Why? Because the Bible says it's given to man once to die and then he will return to us. Turn your Bible to Hebrews 9.27 and Luke 20.36. But go to Hebrews 9.27 first. Hebrews 9th chapter 27th verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So every man must die one time, not twice. That's the physical death. Don't forget Revelation speaks about a second death, which is the death of the soul. Because once man dies in the physical form, then he's in a spiritual state, then judgment comes. And then after judgment, the determination of whether man will go back into eternal life or be transformed into an angel or will he go into the fire and the brimstone and be perished. So that's the second death. But when they speak about the resurrection, they're speaking about a person coming back to life. So when Lazarus was supposedly resurrected in the books of St. John chapter 11, verses 6, 17, 20, 30, and 32, they pass all through that whole thing. They speak about his resurrection. Just go to John 11, 23, and let's see what happens. 11th chapter of John, 23rd verse. This me love from him. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall raise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again. In They're his saying rise again. Because first of all, Jesus said, well, Your brother shall raise again. Martha said unto him, meaning Jesus, I know that he will raise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she's separating, bringing him back to life at this point. You see that? Mm -hmm. From the resurrection at the end of the world. But she wants him right now back in life. So what happens next? Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. I am in charge of that resurrection on the last day. I am the resurrection. I know that. Go ahead. And the life. And the power to bring a person back to life right now. So Jesus separated the two right here. He said, I am the resurrection. I control the last day, Yom Akhri, or Yom Kiyama, when men shall resurrect. And I also control the power to bring men back to life now. And go ahead, what he said. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, if Lazarus was a firm believer in the Messiah, even though he was dead, he shall live. He shall come back to life. Correct? Let's go to uh, St. John chapter 11, verse 6. When he, had heard the, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. After Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, did Jesus come running back? No, he stayed. Two now, days. couldn't Jesus have raised the dead? Keep that quote. Turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 15. We're going to see where Jesus healed the person who was in another whole city. 7-11? Yes. Okay. And it came to pass that, that day after that he went into a city called Naim. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh 
to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bore him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up. Here Jesus walks right up to a person, and they're carrying off to bury him now. They've already spiced him and wrapped him. And Jesus puts his hand on one of the bearers and says, Wait. And then commands this boy, right, to, to right. sit up. And this boy sits up, comes back to life. That's one way Jesus brought people back to life. All right? Now go to Matthew 8. I have it. Five. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. Certain soldier comes to Jesus at this point. This is the same soldier, by the way, that was in the garden that let them take Judas in the place of Jesus. Go ahead. And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this, to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into other darkness. There shall be weeping and garrison of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Now, that means that Jesus not only was able to heal by touch, but Jesus was able to heal just by sending a spirit to somebody. Correct? Yes. Yet when he heard about Lazarus, he stayed two more days. He gave Lazarus time to die. He heard that Lazarus was sick. Remember reading it? Yes. And remained two more days before he went. And if you read St. John's chapter 11, verse 1, okay. now there was a certain man was sick, named Lazarus. Lazarus means Allah has helped him. The word Lazarus is ancient Hebrew for the heavenly father has helped him. These names are real important. Go ahead. Of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of Allah that the Son of Allah might be glorified thereby. Jesus told them that Lazarus was not going to die. He said, this sickness was what? It's not unto death. It's not unto death. But it's only for the glorification of? Of Allah. And that the Son of Allah might be glorified thereby. He's saying, this boy will not die because it's going to be by way of something that Jesus does that will show the glory of God to everybody. This is what he's telling them at this point. Go ahead. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. He loved them, but yet when he heard he was sick, he didn't leave right away. He stayed two more days. Go ahead. Then after that, says he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. He said to his disciples, let's go on back down to Judea, Jesus said. And the disciples said, those Jews down there want to kill you. They threw rocks at us before. You didn't tell me you want to go back again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Let's sneak through there. <laughs> What's his answer? 
Let's sneak through there. Now here's a point where Jesus is worried about being stoned to death. Here's a person who the Christians say came in the world at a certain period of time in order to die at a certain period of time. The hour will come, if they say, a specific moment when he should die. That's the Messiah. So if that's true, then he should have no fear of anybody stoning him because he knows the only way he could die would be on the cross if that was the way he was supposed to die. So what is he afraid of? If he's supposed to die on the cross, then he can walk any way he wants. He can walk up his finger, his finger in the soldier's eye and they couldn't do nothing to him because the Christians say he was born to die for their sins. Here he's telling them, listen, if I walk through there in the daytime, they're going to see me, right? But if I walk through there in the night, they won't even know I went through. So let's go at night. Let's hide. Why is he afraid? No one can hurt him if he was supposed to die on the cross for your sins. According to some scripture that Paul talked about that wasn't revealed yet. Go ahead. Three things said he. And after that he says unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Let me tell you a story about how Christians use the English language. I want you all to pay attention to this, right? No. Imagine yourself a foreigner trying to learn English language. Okay? Yeah. And a man is up on a roof and you're on a 10-story building, you're sitting in a window. Okay? And you're the foreigner, you can't speak English. And some guy up on the roof is getting ready to drop a brick. Another man on the ground sees them getting ready to drop the brick at you and he says to you in English, look out! Of course, being a foreigner, you do. You look out the window and get hit on the head with the brick. <laughs> Instead of him saying, be careful, he says, look out. This is what you Christian people do with the English language. You have a way of taking it and using it and making it sound one way when it sounds another like living live. How do you spell live? L-I-V-E. How do you spell live? L-I-V-E. You can get confused at where you live and where you live, huh? <laughs> But it's not confusing to you because it's your language. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. But to people of the scriptures, you would be confusing them. You Christians have a way of altering the meanings of words. Because y'all get the word resurrection and dead mixed up. You get the word sign and miracle mixed up. And living life mixed up. Jesus spoke about the resurrection of something that you'll only do once. And that's at the end of the world you'll resurrect as a sign. So did Lazarus resurrect? No. He, what was he? He was woken up. He was revived. But watch what happens as we go on. Go ahead. Then says his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it, Jesus speak of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. But watch now. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. dead. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there. Listen to this. But go ahead. To the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. I'm happy that he died and I wasn't there because now when I raise him up, you're going to have some faith. That's what Jesus said. I'm happy, he said. Let's look at this. Go ahead. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave. Four days already. He was already laying in the tomb four days, Lazarus. But it says now, what's Lazarus' name? Right. Mean in Hebrew? That will love. He will help him. Will help him. Go ahead. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. It was close to Jerusalem, not far away. Right. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brethren. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here when he was sick, my brother wouldn't have died. This is old faithful Martha, old Lord, old Martha. Now what happens? But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Is Jesus going to revive Lazarus? No. Who's God going to revive him? God. Why are the Christians trying to get Jesus to? Why do Christian preachers say that Reverend Swag and them can revive people? They're saying that they got the gift of touching on hands. Jesus said he don't do anything. He said, I am my own, can do nothing. I am not greater than he who sent me. And here he says it right here again. 
Jesus had no power to bring him back from the dead. Who did? God. Go ahead. Said, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection. Did she believe said, that Jesus had the power to raise her brother? No. She just didn't believe it. She said, I understand what you mean, Lord. I'm um, on the last day that he'll resurrect. Jesus said unto him, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. Go ahead. Though, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So when you are resurrected, will you ever die again? No. Where is Lazarus? Lazarus should still be here, walking around with us. Where is that other boy that he rose? He said, once you are resurrected, you live forever. Correct? Correct. Now, according to them, when Jesus resurrected, the last time they saw him, he was going up to heaven with two angels. They didn't see him die. But where is Lazarus living at? Chicago? Where is he? He should be alive somewhere in the world because he was not supposed to die. With the sense of resurrection, then he's going to die again. That's what I mean. There's a difference between resurrecting and reviving. You can revive a man who has a heart attack and is declared dead, and then he'll only go old and die again. That is not resurrection. That is revival. The Christians are confused. You understand? Jesus had the power to resurrect on the last day because Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah, the Savior to the world that will come at the end of the world. He is not here now. Get that to your heads. And for the people who keep saying, I am the Messiah, I am not the Messiah. You hear me say it? Listen again. Watch. I am not the Messiah. One more time. For those people who say, oh, he's just saying that. <laughs> I am not the Messiah. I was sent to signify and to testify unto you that the Messiah will come. I have been sent to open up the scriptures and reveal them to you so that you will understand his coming. I have been sent to prepare you and dress you like a bride and prepare you for the wedding of the Lamb. I have been sent to make you have the ability to transform yourself from a physical to a spiritual being. I have been sent to open the heavens and walk you in. I have been sent to peel back the skin of lies and ignorance, but I am not the Messiah. I am only sent by the Messiah to prepare the way for his children, the 144,000 first, and then all those who believe after. And the first sign of them is that they will have love between each other. We now have available another 24 hours of True Light tapes by popular demand. Our master teacher and spiritual guide, as Sayyid Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi, has for your listening pleasure and enlightenment a total of 48 hours of True Light tapes, answering all those questions scholars and professors can only get to answer. Covering such topics as, why use the books of the New Testament? Is the last name Jehovah? The 200 fallen angels? Which Jesus do you follow? And much, much more. Ask your local Ansar representatives, the brothers dressed in white, for copies of the True Light Tapes, numbers 1 through 48. If there are no Ansar representatives in your area, call or visit the original tents of Kedar, 717 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Also, ask or write for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by Asayid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. I used to be a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad until he died. Then I became a follower of his son, Wallace D. Muhammad. But I came to find out that he was not teaching the same thing as the messenger. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that you can work for anybody, even the white man who is the devil. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that the white man is not, even though the scriptures say the white man is the devil. Then I started reading books written by Imam Isa, and it explains the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings better than anybody I've ever heard, even Minister Farrakhan. Imam Isa teaches the importance of doing for self, just like Elijah taught us. 
Imam Isa also has his followers dressing in the garb of the prophets like the Quran says. I used to call myself a black Israelite Jew because I thought I was from the tribe of Levi. Nobody could tell me different. Then I finally read one of El Imam Isa's books and I found out that the Israelites never called themselves Jews. That they were all destroyed except for the tribes of Judah and Dan. And that in the Old Testament, the books of Moses, it does speak about Muhammad. And thanks to El Imam Isa, I now know that I'm an Israelite and that we should follow all of the scriptures. This is a devoted follower of El Selassie, the conquering land of Judah. Until I read the pamphlet written by the master Imam Isa about Marcus Garvey, I might learn much about how Marcus Garvey never wore dreadlock, and how his Muslim name was Musa, and the color of his flag was red, black, and green, the same exact flag the Mahdi of Sudan fought under. After encountering the divine truth of the master Imam Isa, I am now devoted to the answers. <laughs>